what is up everybody welcome to the riverfront Bengals show episode 47 where we get to talk about um games that unfortunately occurred last weekend um, that was ugly as hell and i really don't want to talk about it but we kind of have an obligation to do it um, <laughs> why we get paid the big bucks and i mean we get paid in large deer not actual money so <laughs> i am your host joe farsing Alongside me is my friend and yours, Greg Neiman. Greg, how are you, sir? I've I've had better weekends, but but that's okay. Yeah, unfortunately for those that those that were there, and, and again, I want to thank everybody who was there over the weekend at the stretch for our live shows, the um, the Riverfront's 500th show, you know, the Reds related one. Um, had a lot of fun, met a lot of cool people, people that we've you know seen through Slack channel, people that we've you know just seen commenting through everything. Um, Greg unfortunately had car troubles and was unable to make it. And cars suck. I, I there's not really any other way to put it. Yeah, um, I mean, made the, made the final payment on it, and then it's just like <laughs> as soon as you feel good, you know, just forget <laughs> it. Uh. So hope you know. So at the one thousandth show, Greg will absolutely be there. <laughs> um, uh, we'll have a five hundred show at some point before then, I assume. So we'll we'll make sure we will we'll send out. You know, we'll, we'll pull all yep. stops. Get yeah, a chauffeur. I'll, be, I'll yeah. be ready to Uber. Yeah, we'll get you an Uber Black. <laughs> we are we we are high class. We are nothing but uh, class here. So, <laughs> uh, before we get going, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtubecom slash Cincy. We are giving away tickets to the Bengals and Seattle Seahawks game on October fifteenth. Two of them, but you must be subscribed. If you're if you're just watching them without knowing, then how do we know how to give them away? So. Um, we'll be giving, we'll have details when we're going to give that away, but again, free tickets is free tickets. Speaking of discounted tickets, do want to give also props to our good friends over at SeatGeek. Anyone who's paying regular price for a ticket, I don't know what you guys are doing. Use our code with your first SeatGeek offer. Their platform is the easiest to use. Green dots, when you pull up the map, green dot says you're getting a good price. Red dot means you're getting screwed. Stay away from the red dots, green dots only, and again, Use our code one word riverfront for twenty dollars off your first seat geek order. Unfortunately, it's time to go into a little bit of a post mortem about the uh, debacle at in Cleveland on the lake. Yeah, that was it was our it was our red dot for the weekend. Yeah, it, it was an absolute red dot game. Yeah, um, as you know, with lost twenty four to three to the Browns, and I'm putting that it's complete and abject failure. Um, I've never seen a Bengals offense look that bad in probably, I can think to a maybe 2001 game against the Ravens, uh, John Kenna, they won like 37 to nothing. I, that legitimately might've been the closest game that I've seen to that. Um, Brad Robbins got a lot of workout in his first NFL game, 10 punts, uh, one off a team record. Um, yay, but he was also terrible. Um, Give him a little bit of a pass. Conditions were crappy. And, you know, nerves might be a little bit. And then you just keep getting sent out there drive after drive. But um, I've never seen Joe Burrow look worse over an extended period of time, much less the entire game. What I mean, was it just the weather? Was it just coming back? Like, not a lot of um, not a lot of reps after the injury. What do you I mean, combo that? What do you think? I think it's a it's a big culmination of everything. Uh, the weather clearly uh, was not conducive to throwing the football. I mean, you could see that with Deshaun Watson too. Balls were just dying. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the other aspect of this is it, it was week one, so you don't have a ton of, especially for the Bengals with the way they handled preseason. Which I'm not I'm not saying that's wrong, but the way they handled preseason, you don't have a bunch of you're not going to have built-in answers like it's week 14. You know, when something's not working, you can't go to X, Y, and Z. Uh, right now, you're kind of playing with A, B, and C, and that's it. You know, you're kind of you're hamstrung a little bit on 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 how much you can do. Um, I thought there would be some rust, but I think when you when you mix in the rust with the conditions, uh, and then I think you have to give. Unfortunately, you have to give Cleveland some credit. Uh, the Bengals do not match up well against Cleveland with with their D line. Um, that that's that's really really good. Uh, so I do think you have to give some credit to to Cleveland, but I just thought it was a culmination of all those things uh, that led to what looked like it was his worst performance ever, and statistically it was. But uh, for me, my my level of concern for Joe Burrow would be 
uh, zero or less than zero, if, if that could be the case. I just, it, it kind of is what it is type of thing and, and move on and, and uh, we'll use the old Aaron Rodgers thing. Everybody relax. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, going back to what you said about uh, even with Deshaun Watson, with the balls were dying, everyone knows Deshaun Watson loves it when balls are lively. So, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, we'll, we'll move on there. Um, <laughs> You're not wrong. Sorry, folks, I can't let this pass. <laughs> um, my question to you, I mean, you're a football coach. I'm not. Why didn't they change the game plan? Obviously, I don't think rain was even in the forecast. Um, and it literally rained all damn game. I mean, three hours long. I was checking the radar, and there were small little blurbs that were just kind of hanging over downtown Cleveland, and they never moved. So I understand they didn't expect the weather to be crappy, so you can't adjust your game plan to weather that you didn't know was going to happen. But never mind that Cleveland, again, like you said, Cleveland matches up with them well. They've got a great defensive line, and their cornerbacks are some of the, you know, one of the few cornerback tandems or, you know, back uh, position groups that can match up pretty well man to man versus the Bengals. And they played man to man. Bengals just couldn't beat them. Why didn't they change the game plan? Why didn't they try to run more? Is it just stubbornness or? I think it goes back to it's it's week one. Uh, you have only a percentage of your playbook in if, if this was a a week 12 game uh you have 11 game plans before that that you can carry over to that week 12 when you find out the weather is horrible and you've planned to pass uh like you like you normally would i mean yeah. first and 10 the Bengals they they need to be able to drop back and throw the ball and pick up seven and then be sitting in second and three uh them them lining up to run is never going to be their their go-to strategy and i just feel like the game plan it was what it was and 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 trying to change the game plan at that point it would have looked even worse uh it would have been like just sacrificial lambs um out there if you would have tried to i i think you would have if if they would have changed to a run heavy strategy it would have been you would have seen a handful of plays over and over and over and over and over and and that would have been even worse um so Again, I, I don't put this on the play caller. I don't put it on the players. I, I just think it's it's part of – it was like the perfect storm. Um, and you're like, well, Cleveland seemed to handle it all right. Well, you know, Cleveland's entire ball club fits. Let's go play in nasty weather. Let's – let's. I mean, that's exactly what Cleveland is. Yeah. Uh, they're a run-first team. Cincinnati clearly is not. Um, not making excuses, but it was a perfect storm for Cleveland – uh, that benefited them in every single way, and none of the none of the circumstances benefited the Bengals at all. I think if 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 it's good weather, I think you're looking at a totally different game. Uh, I think Burrow has totally different numbers. Um, the one thing I will say is, for 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 Burrow, I think that his game. The thing that I'm a little bit excited about was his decision making was there. Um, like it wasn't like poor decisions. It was just the, the conditions weren't, weren't conducive to throwing the football. Um, so I think there's still a lot of upside to be had here. I just think it was a perfect storm of lack of game plan or minimalized game plan uh, mixed with bad weather and uh, Cleveland got on top and stayed on top. Yeah. And, and that's the one thing that you could say, he didn't put the ball in jeopardy at all. Um I don't even think it was there was even a pass that was even considerably, you know, considered a, you know, close to being an intercepted or anything. And that's what killed him last year in week one is he put the ball up for grabs a bunch of times. Um, the ball just came out weird. I, again, because it was probably heavy. I mean, even Kevin Stefanski said the ball was really heavy. Just it, they couldn't keep, uh, uh, couldn't keep a bunch of what dry balls because it, it never stopped raining. And it just looked like he was shot putting it. I wonder how much. And I think the answer is significantly he's still favoring or maybe not favoring, but he didn't try to extend plays outside the pocket. A lot of the times, a lot of the passes were rushed because he wasn't going to escape. He could have moved up in the pocket or tried to escape and made a play. And and he just didn't. Um, I don't know if it's because he just didn't feel like he could, or he was staying disciplined to the, you know, to the plan of listen, don't, you know, you might be, Feeling better, it might be strong, but you're not fully 100% healthy. We don't want you to pull something and have you know get it healed up and you know be ready 
you know, to play you know, the next 16 games. So um, on the flip side, go. I, I feel like he was sticking to the game plan. I mean, yeah. you signed that deal. This had, this had to be a, a clear conversation with them before the game because Joe Burrow's out here to win. I mean, he's not a guy that's going to hold back. Uh, we know Joe Burrow. There's one thing that he loves more than anything in the world. That's winning. Uh, and so I think that was definitely something that was spoke about and discussed because it was, it was clear. Yeah. Um, weekend weather coming up is supposed to be pretty beautiful, 75 and sunny. So um, at least not going to have the rain. Hopefully I'm going to be another week along um, in, you know, since the injury and everything again, I don't think he's still going to be fully running. I don't think it's going to be like 2021 to where it was mid season before they took the, uh, training wheels off before, you know, they let him kind of run around, scramble and do the magic that he can do. But I think we're still probably a few weeks away, but the weather is going to be a lot more conducive to a more Bengals looking game plan and throws and everything. Um, on the flip side, I think the Bengals defense looked really strong in the first half. Uh, three sacks, three hits, 14 hurries. The defensive line, as expected, they were all over. Uh, Zach Carter made some plays. Uh, that's, Dax Hill had an easy pick off of a tipped pass by um, uh, by Zach Carter. I don't think anybody, first glance, no one thought that he even got a piece of it. It was more looking like Watson's just throwing the ball right into Dax Hill's bread basket. But yeah. um, DJ Turner played a lot more. I don't think we knew what the plan was with um, with Cheeto and uh, Cheeto Bay Wizzy. Pretty much on a pitch count, he and Turner uh, kind of rotated. And I thought DJ Turner played great. He did not look like a rookie. Uh, I think he had played 35 snaps. Um, mm-hmm. The only one who I think didn't particularly play well is Mike Hilton because teams are starting to target him and realize he's short and slow. and He's not great in pass coverage. The Bengals are going to have to adjust to that. I mean, that's he gave up, I think, like 50 yards in receptions. That's after last game they played against the uh, Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. He gave up 130 yards receiving, so. Book is out on him. He needs to be used as a movable piece, not as a guy to cover. And they have the horses now. I mean, they've got uh, DJ Turner, especially when Cheeto's back to being able to play a full game. They can take Mike Hilton off the field and not lose anything, you know, in in, in yep. terms of his jack of all trades type stuff. Um, I think the most important thing to take away is no major injuries. You look at every other team in the division, half the teams around the league. There were a lot of injuries in the first week. Um, Browns lost Jack Conklin on the first drive. First drive early in the game. It, it was early, yeah. Yeah, it was a bad looking knee injury. It was one of the ones he just got uh, some just rolled up into his knee. And it's as soon as you saw that, you're like, he's, yeah. they immediately said he's out for the game. And you assumed, yeah, yeah he's probably headed for surgery. So um, outside of that, I don't know if you have any final thoughts. I'm ready just to kind of flush it, but. I think that uh, what you said is exactly right. Defense played very, very well. And I don't think um, the 24 points on the board is not indicative of how well they played. Um, Unfortunately, when you're a defense and the other team gets, you know, when you're on offense going three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, uh, the defense was on the field the entire time. Uh, I thought they played very, very well. Um, If the Bengals offense is moving the ball, like normal, uh, just from a standpoint of the defense not being on the field. Um, I think you're talking about the Bengals defense playing one of the best games you've seen in in some time. I thought they played very, very well. So I think there is something to build on there um, as a defense. If you look just at the defense, uh, I think you could actually have a pretty high grade there for the, for that unit. I thought they I thought they played pretty well. Yeah, I mean, they just got worn down. I mean, it was a, Cleveland completely owned the field position game because yeah. Bengals went three and out, three and out, three and out, five and out. Three and, you know, it they couldn't yeah. get anything sustained. And Cleveland gets one or two first downs, and that field's already flipped. So, um, And then Cleveland started leaning on the run game, and that's when Nick Chubb feasts. And that's basically where the, when the game was over. They were just able to lean on Nick Chubb, and that's why the numbers look like what they did. But, yeah, defense, I, I was – Nothing but happy and impressed the way that Lou's crew came out and did what you wanted to see. And players played well. Players you wanted to see play well played well. And um, Trey Hendrickson had another good game. He was in his face uh, and watched his face a lot. So, yeah. All right. Let's flush the toilet on that one. 
Please, Let's, yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a couple quick awards before we move on, though. Uh, stud of the game. Let me prompt it here. That takes you back, doesn't it? <laughs> sure, stud of the week for this. Uh, who's the best around this week for week one for you? Um, I actually took Joe Mixon. I thought Joe Mixon showed serious burst. Um, I was pleasantly surprised with how Joe Mixon looked. Um, I know his stats weren't weren't crazy. I think he ran it up running for like 58, uh, if, if I remember that correctly, off the top of my head. Um, but I thought the burst was there. And if we can get if we can get that look from Joe Mixon when the Bengals offense is humming, um, ooh, I mean, watch out. Uh, I was I was a little nervous about Joe Mixon coming into the year, you know, tread on the tires. It's yeah. another year. I thought he looked explosive and I thought he looked ready for ready for a, a big chunk of carries. I, I was very, very happy with Joe Mixon. Yeah, he had uh, 13 carries for 56 yards. 56. Yeah, 34 of those came on back-to-back -back carries. Um, start off a drive, I, and this was kind of like, Bengals were down 3 nothing at this point. <laughs> and the, the way they started the drive, like, okay, cool, they're going to start running the ball and maybe work off of play action off of the run. Uh, first carry was for 12 yards, absolutely just ran over a couple of guys. Uh, that, I think he had, like, ran over someone after eight yards and carried him for another four yards. Uh, next play, 22 yards down the uh, off right guard. And, like, run game is cooking. Guys are, you know, offensive lines ready to feast. And then took him out, two runs to Trevion Williams for nothing, for, you know, two yards, five yards. Third down, they decided to throw long to Higgins for reasons unknown and decided to punt fourth and three from the uh, Cleveland 38, which is just a weak-ass decision. Yeah. It's... I get the offense isn't going well, but the offense isn't going well. You've got a drive where the team's actually moving the ball a little bit. You've got some momentum, and it's only three yards, you know, check down, you know, do a run, you know, RPO, whatever. You've got options of what to do, and instead they curl up, punt, and Brad Robbins punts the ball into the end zone for a net of 18 yards. I feel like those decisions in a game – will tell you everything you need to know. Like all the questions you're asking about things that we're not sure about, the, those decisions on fourth and three to punt from the Browns 38, that tells you exactly what Zach Taylor felt. Uh, to me, that is just such a telling uh, decision. Um, and I'm not saying he's wrong. Um, I, I just don't think Zach Taylor, I, I think that's that tells you how he felt about that game that day with that weather, with the game plan. Everything they were prepared for him, go, him punting the ball on fourth and three early tells me all I need to know. Because if you look at Zach Taylor's history with the Bengals, what's the one thing you can guarantee he'll be aggressive? And Usually, yeah. uh, and, and he and he wasn't. Um, so I think that was that was a telling sign. And it, not that it's good or bad, but I do think that that gave away some information of, of where they felt the Bengals were at at that moment. It's funny because the. Um... They have the trackers to tell you what the, how the win probability changes, whether you go forward, whether you punt, field goal, whatever. Their win probability dropped by over 5% by making the decision to um, uh, to punt instead of actually either trying to kick the field goal or go. Um, definitely was not a, I don't know. I I thought that they should have gone forward. I, I don't know if you want to try a 56-yarder in the rain. I mean, McPherson has the leg, but he missed a 52-yarder. It's, you know, the, it's not ideal. Um, I, I thought that was waving a white flag a little early, and that was a little bothersome, but yeah, neither here nor there. Uh, for my stud, it is Jermaine Pratt. He had a fantastic, especially in the first half. He was everywhere. He was um, a monster. Oh, yeah. He's proving that he wasn't just going out for a payday. Like, he wants to be the best linebacker. And, I mean, he made a hell of a case for it. Had 11 tackles, had a sack, uh, forced fumble. Um, fumble was huge because Cleveland was driving. Um, I forget what they were on the field, but it was, um, yeah, there we go. They were at the 21 when, uh, yeah, yeah, right just outside the red zone when they fumbled. So, I mean, that's game was nothing to nothing at that point. So, that was definitely a huge point early in the game that should have, could have switched momentum. So, um, he 
among many defensive players, he absolutely stood out. So he did. Yeah, he keeps, be- he keeps saying he wants to be a three down backer. I mean, he uh, he he went out there and said, "There you go. This is what I got." Yeah, it's He's- you've got him and Logan Wilson around for several years, and that's that's a fantastic thing. Those guys are both fantastic. Um, it's someone's going to have an off game here or there, but you're not going to have both those guys have a bad game during the same day. So you're going to have good linebacking play uh, at least from, you know, one of them. And they're what top two of the top 15 linebackers probably. I would say. Yeah. I mean, there's Fred Warner and then there's kind of a group of them. And I think they're in the group right behind that. So, yeah. Anyway, onto those who did not fare so well here. So that boy is good. Mm-hmm. Good and terrible. <laughs> I hate to do it. He's going to go down as the greatest Bengal of all time. Joe Burrow was a dud. 14 of 31, 82 yards, no touchdowns. Again, no interceptions. That's the important thing. And he came out healthy, but throws were nowhere near on target. The communication, that's what's frustrating. There just seemed like a lot of miscommunication with receivers that he's been working with for three, four years. There's not like it's he's moving to a new team or there's a new receiving core. These are the T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, you know, running backs that have, you know, that he's been playing with for multiple years. And it 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 just they looked absolutely lost. And this is probably the only time ever gonna put Burrow in the dud category. So can't favor him just because he's our beloved, but Yeah. It wasn't good. <laughs> My uh, my dud for the week was uh, fantasy football wise. My boy T Higgins, I had him playing as well. So zero catches for zero yards. Uh, maybe not all his fault, but uh, it was a fantasy heartbreaker uh, going against Dallas's defense for a for a loss. So that was tough. Uh, so T Higgins, if I could have had a couple catches, that would have helped. But uh, I'll go with T Higgins as my dud with zero catches, zero yards. Uh, T Higgins, Joe Burrow. We still love you. It's okay. I had Joe Burrow as my quarterback and um, Travis Kelsey as my tight end, and I ended up losing by 21 and a half points. So, oh, wow. That's not bad, I'm, really. I, I'm a little salty as well. So, I'm, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, fantasy I mean, sports. Fan, the, fan, go, fan, go ahead. My bad. Go ahead. Uh, fantasy sports is just like drafting or j- just like gambling late money on a game. It just sucks. It's just you're gonna get kicked in the balls unless you're like some savant. It, it, it's gonna be yeah. ball crushing. So, yeah for for my fantasy team this week we're gonna we're gonna regroup. Uh, I know we're gonna get in the weight room a lot this week. A lot of preparation. <laughs> uh, we've got to we've got to really figure some things out. We're built for the long haul. So, you know, week one, but we, I build fantasy teams for week ten through fifteen. So, plenty of time. Plenty of time. I appreciate <laughs> the optimism. That's yeah. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Uh, I'm going up against Trevor Lawrence and Matt. We're, we have a super flex. Okay. So Matt, uh, Trevor Lawrence and Matthew Stafford, and they ended up still losing that game. So I got my work cut out for me. But we'll <laughs> Good <it> luck. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, a little bit of quick news before we move on to uh, Baltimore's game. Uh, Lyle Collins released last night. No word on last night. This is Wednesday afternoon. We're recording. This will be out Thursday. So this is Tuesday evening. No statement on why. Uh, a couple kind of thoughts. It's he's not moving, not progressing very well in his recovery. I mean, he's only nine months after an ACL injury, and he's someone who's had injuries to deal with beforehand. Um, if he's able to pass a physical, then they're able to waive him without having to pay any um, um, injury settlement. So that could be what it is, you know, just a uh, chance to save seven million, you know, whatever the savings is. There's still a chance. I I wouldn't put it past them to try to bring him back and sign him league minimum, reduce salary, whatever, uh, keep him in the fold. But as of yet, nothing. Hopefully, maybe that money is going to be going to uh, T. Higgins, in, you know, in the offseason. We'll see. Uh, what do you think about Lowell Collins? I mean, I, I completely agree. I think this is in no way saying that the Bengals are done with Lowell Collins. Uh, and, and I would – if, if he can get back to healthy, uh, if you can bring Lael Collins on in week 12 or 13 or 14 healthy, um, I think you would be crazy as a Bengals fan to not set, to not want 
to go into the playoffs with a third tackle sitting on the bench that you can throw in and feel, you know, decent about. Uh, we, we've seen the, the last two years uh, when we when we've gotten eliminated, it's you can almost directly point to the offensive line. Um, so I would love to see him back with the Bengals and healthy uh, some at some point this year. I would I would love to see it. So you don't think this is them saying that we trust uh, Dante Smith and Jackson Carmen over Lyle Collins over the long term? I don't see that. That's good because I don't think anybody would trust. I mean, Smith's kind of coming into his own and showing ability to be, a, you know, an extra tackle, kind of the swing tackle. Um, mm-hmm. We've seen nothing but steaming piles of garbage outside of small glimpses from Carmen. So. Yeah, and I and I my biggest thing with Carmen is is I think he's good enough to maybe at some point be that. My biggest fear is that I don't know that I trust Jackson Carmen to be on the bench and be a backup and just grind every day to get so much better to to be the guy. I just haven't seen that from him. It's been kind of like a dejected kind of look from him. Um so I don't I just don't trust him when he's not in the game to say, you know what, I got to have a pro bowler mentality to show up every day, work hard, grind, get better. I don't know that I, I don't know that I trust him to, to pull that off. Yeah. And we're not there in team practices. We're not there in meetings. We don't know how much actual work he puts in. He could be the hardest working guy. We don't know, but it's, it's his kind of nonverbal communication that just kind of gives off just, He's there. Um, I, you know, I, I think most of Bengals fandom would have been cool if they would have just let him go and taken, you know, taken a flyer on someone released by another team. Just, at, you know, better the, you know, you know what you have, and it's not yeah. great. So why hang out to it? So the the whole thing goes like he's everything in my mind just just points to this is not good. Uh, you know, he's from here. So he's home. He's comfortable. Even though he's the backup, he, he what does he really have to fight for? I mean, he, he he's he's home and everything's cool. And you go home and everybody loves you and nobody's nobody's telling you you suck. You know what I mean? Like when when you get oh you're Jackson Carmen, you're the best. I just I just don't know that I see that grind. Like I think maybe Cincinnati is a bad spot for him and he needs to be somewhere else where uh, he's not going home to praise. Uh, you know, could, because it's he's around his people outside of a bubble. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it makes sense. Um, and we mentioned this during the live show, but Joe Burrow is a lot wealthier than the last time we spoke on this show. A little bit, um, just a bit five year, $275 million extension. Uh, he is the highest paid NFL player in history. Uh, average of 52 and a half million dollars per season. I would be okay with one season of that, much less five of it. Uh, $219 million guaranteed, the most guaranteed money to any player in NFL history. Um, the way that it's structured is pretty is really well, too. I don't have the specific numbers, but he's actually taken up less of the team's uh, salary cap year over year than um, Lamar Jackson and some others. So they made it. Did it pretty smart. Obviously, the the, the cap is going to keep exploding, so it's kind of right. silly to pretend. And, and and the cap is only a thing if you want to make it an excuse anyway. You can manipulate and move money around. I I don't understand how it all works, but it's it's imaginary. Yeah. Um. Speaking of money being there and being team friendly, hopefully some of this money goes. Although I'm, I'm less confident now than I was, ever has been. Um, T. Higgins is uh, through his age. Well. There have been leaks through the media that have clearly come from his agency. Uh, I'm not going to negotiate through the season. Uh, basically, they're done until the end of the season. Then Bengals are probably going to end up tagging him. They're not going to like it, and then they'll figure out that crap later. But um, if if he wants to get paid twenty five million dollars, like I I'm okay paying him upwards of twenty million a year, something like that. I think he you know he's for the Bengals, he's worth it. I think on the open market, he's can make more. But if he wants to get paid twenty five, whatever these next round of guys, I mean, uh, Jefferson didn't hasn't uh, signed an extension yet. T. 
Keaty Lamb hasn't signed an extension yet, so we don't know what the money's going to look like. Uh, it's even by the time next year when Jamar Chase rolls around. But if he wants to get paid like those guys, it's not happening. Bengals aren't going to be able to pay two guys at the very top end. And I don't think they should, for that matter. You can take that money and improve, you know, spend it other places. And I'd rather have T. I mean, I think it's the, it having two guys that are totally different types of players. It makes the team absolutely dynamic, especially when you throw in Tyler, who's a totally separate and equally great receiver. But I think he'll get tagged and probably pay out, play out 2024 and end up elsewhere in 25. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's probably most, I don't want to say most likely, but that seems like the easiest solution uh, that I see happening. Um, what I would love to see is I'd love to see T Higgins take ownership of his own career. Like these guys squabble over five and $10 million when you're making, you know, hundreds um, for, for a player like T Higgins, he'll make a hundred million at least in his career. Um, and, and I'm not telling T Higgins to stay in Cincinnati. I want T Higgins to do what's best for him and what he wants to do. But I think T Higgins wants to be in Cincinnati and I think if there's some give and take there, then T. Higgins should be in Cincinnati. Um, I, I know we all love him in Cincinnati. And uh, if he does end up moving on, we'll wish him the best. Uh, but I, I just hope for T. Higgins that he doesn't let uh, his agent or a couple dollars get in the way of what's going to make him happy for the better part of the next 10 years. Um, you know, you have a window of 10 years of football happiness that you can have or football sadness. And, uh, you know, uh, Jesse Bates is happy today because he had a great game and Atlanta won. Uh, Jesse Bates will not be happy in 10 weeks. Um, after watching Desmond Ritter play Sunday, the Falcons have no shot to beat anybody of, of significance. Um, so for T Higgins, I think you you don't know what you what you don't know. I mean, when was the last time T Higgins was part of a bad football team? It wasn't at Clemson. It hadn't been in the NFL. Uh, so you just think that every week's the same when you're winning. It's really easy to show up and work. Um, what happens when you're five and eleven? Uh, are you still happy playing football, or would you give away five million dollars to be back with the Bengals and be twelve and four? So. I just hope that T finds a way to get what he wants um, and still be happy. And I hope he doesn't let his, the agent or the money take over that um, take over that entire scenario. I understand you got to get your dollars, but really hone in on on being a being a happy football player because it does make a world of difference. I will not stand here for Des Ritter slander. I just have something to show real quick. <laughs> Oh, no. Desmond Ritter, 26 and 0 record oh. at home as a starting quarterback in the I, NFL and in college. I didn't even say anything that I was going to bash Desmond Ritter and you have a and you have a pull up ready to go. You have a picture ready to go. <laughs> I didn't we did not discuss this before this. So somehow he knew I was going to bash Desmond Ritter and here he comes with a with a with a with a sign that says 26 and 0. There was a tweet that was out just a little bit before we went on the air, and so I had to download the image just in case you were going <laughs> to throw any shot. I, I, I was uh, debating bringing it up because uh, I, I've heard your slander against Desmond before, and I <laughs> I wish him the best. But, uh, innocent until proven guilty. Winner uh, until proven otherwise. Yeah, well, he's, uh, you know, they did win. Oh, great, great job. What was 13 of 15 for... He threw for a couple more yards than Burrow in a run yeah. heavy offense. <laughs> I, mean, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. We'll let Desmond Ritter go. I'll let it go. It's he has to be a caretaker. Um, again, we're we're not a Falcons podcast, but he needs to be good enough for Bajan Robinson to feast because I've got Bajan on my team. So that's yeah, you know. I, I wasn't one of those that thought Des Ritter was going to be a first round pick or thought that he should have been a first round pick. Um, but he's not untalented. He's a good, he's an intelligent, very good learner. He's a good dude. This, this comes from my university of Cincinnati hatred. I just, I don't <laughs> like the university of Cincinnati. I, I don't, it's, I have too many friends that are UC fans and now, my hatred for the University of Cincinnati has grown and grown and grown, which I don't know how that's even possible, but, you know. 
And now we have um, Riverfront U covering UC, among other schools. So he's used to a lot more Bearcats Nation. And I'm all here for it. I'll be here for the Xavier stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that other school. Norwood Tech. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I've ever heard that. I can't say too much. Bearcats can't beat them for whatever reason. I don't know. What... Ever. It's frustrating. Anyway, hey, how about we move on to Baltimore? Let's do it. Uh, home opener, 1 p.m. at Paycor. I'm excited for this one. Baltimore beats Houston 25-9. The game was an ugly, ugly game. They were actually outgained by the Texans under a first-year, first-game C.J. Stroud. Uh, 268 yards, 265. I Lamar Jackson, 17 of 22, 169 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. That looks like the old Lamar Jackson, not this new and approved with a... Uh, with all these weapons, obviously we're not taking one game samples for anything more than what, you know, one small data point, but yeah, that's, I, that's a, that's so that's a game you figured that they would roll. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, when I watched, I, I did, you know, happen to catch some of this game, you know, flipping back and forth and watching all the games, but uh, there, there's one thing that comes to mind and uh, it's a good coach's rant, the famous coach's rant. They are who we thought they were. I mean, <laughs> the Ravens are exactly who we thought they were. Uh, they, they Lamar is Lamar. You gave a guy money that can't throw the ball from the pocket. He can only hit tight ends. Zay Flowers is going to be a bust, not because Zay Flowers isn't good, but because you can't get him the ball. OBJ's washed up. I mean, all of it was they are who we thought they were. Uh, they're going to play defense. They're going to kick field goals to try to, to try to win games. I just the, – the Ravens are exactly what we thought they were uh, against a bad Texans team, and they did not look good. Now, granted, they're walking away 1-0, more power to them, but I just don't understand why people are so high on the Ravens talking about Super Bowl and, and winning the AFC North and all this stuff. Uh, Lamar Jackson has one playoff win. Uh I just I, I can't I just can't do it I, I don't understand it I really don't see what people see and this isn't me being a Bengals homer I just don't see it Lamar Jackson here we go is Desmond Ritter 2.0 I mean I don't I just don't see it you can't throw the ball from the pocket you're not going to get things done it's just not going to happen they'll win nine or ten games every year he's in there because he's a good regular season quarterback because he can run around but you get to big time games and he's going to get beat I mean that's just the way it is. Yeah, I mean, he had one interception. He had two fumbles, lost one of them. And it's, I don't know, it's one, you know, one day, a moment of time. But this was a home game. It's yeah. one thing if it's, you know, the Texans are rejuvenated because, I mean, they've been kind of a beat down franchise, but they've got a new quarterback. They got um, um, Will Anderson, new coach. Like, they may feed off the home crowd. No, this was a game in Baltimore at MNT Bank State, their field, and they didn't play well. And, and now, and and and, and Grant, they were without Marlon Humphrey, but it's not like they had the ball thrown all over their head. And they're without Mark Andrews, but they have all these wide receivers now. This is they're a wide open show. They've got Zay Flowers, they've got Odell Bo, uh, Beckham, they've got Rashad Bateman, and they didn't do anything. He completed one pass to a tight end for four yards. And that was the Isaiah likely like, yeah. And they're coming in here like absolutely as hobbled as a team could be after one week. Um, JK Dobbins. And, and you hate this for the guy. I'm, I'm not, yeah. not an Ohio state guy. So I don't, you know, don't have any uh, emotional hold to this guy, but he just, he's a talented running back and, and, and he just can't stay healthy. Uh, tore his Achilles out for the year. We forgot to mention that other guy who tore his Achilles. We'll, we'll get to that before we, Boogie too. Um, so he's gone. Uh, safety Marcus Williams, he's going to be out this game. Ronnie Stanley, offensive tackle, he's expected to miss this week with a knee strain. Tyler Lindebaugh in the center, sprained his ankle, he's expected to miss this week. Um, Mark Andrews, again, missed last week. Questionable, I'm not sure. I've, I've got to wait until I see any uh, injured designations and practice participation. Uh, Marlon Humphrey, again, missed last week questionable but supposedly has a shot to play i think they probably this early in the season i don't think that they rush him back i mean that's not the i don't think it's a smart thing to do when it's in week two you're not in panic mode when they won anyway but 
how does a team this this can't just be a product of them trying to win every game of the preseason, but how does a team keep getting this injured week after week after season after season after season? It's 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 the same story. All these people that are Patriot or Patriot uh, Ravens followers that say that they're going to be phenomenal. Oh well, we're finally healthy. J.K. Dobbins is finally healthy. I mean, you say it every single year, and every single year you have twenty guys on the IR that are useful players. It happens every single year. When does Harbaugh get some blame for the preseason stuff? At some point, you have to. I, I, even if it's not true, I mean, you just have to look at that. You go all in on the preseason and every single year you have a list of guys on the IR that are done for the season. I mean, there has to be some correlation. There's got to be. And it's every single year and every single year you listen to Ravens fans. We're finally healthy. We're finally healthy. We have 17 running backs now. I mean, it does not matter. They, they, they're going to run the ball with Lamar Jackson They'll make the playoffs. They'll they'll do their things. They get to a big game. He cannot throw the ball from the pocket, so it doesn't matter. You have to be able to throw the – it's not – this isn't 1995. You have to throw the ball from the pocket on time accurately. He can't do it. I, I just the, – the Ravens are the most frustrating team to me in the NFL when I hear people tell me how good they're going to be because you have to throw the ball from the pocket to win in the NFL, period. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of anti Bengals in terms of the health because Taylor actually gets a lot of uh, crap for not playing anyone in preseason and they show up rusty. I mean, that's yeah. that was a big problem with the beginning of last year, starting known too, and big problem this year. Now, again, last year and this year, you wouldn't have had Burrow, so timing, communication, those type of things, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, maybe for the offensive line, just to have live bullet reps outside of a handful of snaps against the. Um, uh, Packers in the um, uh, joint practices that they had. Yeah, right. you're not seeing a lot of live bullets. But, I mean, Zach gets blamed for that, and the guys end up staying healthy, and they've had two, you know, and they've finished the last two seasons strong at the end. I mean, Super Bowl and AFC Championship game. I think Harbaugh deserves credit for that. Just, yeah, causation does not always equal correlation, but there's now a history. Maybe now that they've lost and nobody gives a shit, they'll stop focusing on preseason and just we're just going to play these guys one drive just to kind of you know do what pretty much everyone else does. But it, it it's got to be frustrating. I would say I feel bad for Ravens fans, but they're kind of arrogant ass wipes. Um, I yeah I I don't feel bad for them. So I will say I went to a game. I went to a game in Baltimore a couple years ago. And uh, we sat first row in the end zone, great seats. And the people there were absolutely extremely delightful. Surprise! Now, they did beat our ass, uh, so <laughs> that probably helped. But uh, they it was uh, it was a very enjoyable environment uh, in, in Baltimore. I must say, the one time I was there, it was it was pretty enjoyable. I say that, and again, like the only real kind of interaction I have is through, you know, online, through, inter- you know, social media and things like that. And, and that's the worst for everybody. I mean, everyone brings yeah. out their worst self. So that's probably not fair. Most fans of most teams are reasonable, decent people. It's just, you don't really want good things to happen to them just because, right. you know, not yeah, me, I, mean, so I don't really care. <laughs> but you got to pick your poison going, going back to Bengals Ravens. I mean, so the Bengals play nobody in the preseason and, and, and people complain. Uh, the Ravens play everybody. Uh, and so, I mean, the Bengals have what Joseph Asai is basically it when you talk yep. about injuries and it's not, hopefully it's, you know, something pretty small, uh, and, but you, you look at the Ravens. I mean, you, you already have a list of guys and these are not just average guys. These are playmakers, Tyler Linderbaum. I mean, JK Dobbin, these are guys, I mean, Tar- Mark Andrew, these are dudes, um, that they have out uh, and it's a list of them. So who would you rather be? Would you rather be the Ravens 1-0 beating a horrible Texans team, uh, but you have everybody out? Or would you rather be the Bengals sitting at 0-1? Uh, again, a familiar spot, but everybody's healthy and you're ready to go. I, I would I would take the Bengals st- side of it every day of the week. Yeah, I'm looking at the Bengals injury right now, and Joseph Osai is questionable, and then you've got two guys that were either special teamers or special teamers. It would have been um, practice squatters or guys who would have been cut. 
Marvell Tell and Devontae Maxwell, who were both, you know, injured during camp. Those are the only injuries for the entire team. Yeah. And when you go to Baltimore, there is J.K. Dobbins, Marcus Williams, Mark Andrews, Ronnie Staley, Marlon Humphrey, Tyler Linderbaum. Um, and then another eight guys, or yeah, no, another seven guys that were hurt during camp. Malik Ham, Marion Williams, Keaton Mitchell. I, I that guy, I thought that he was a interesting guy coming out of um, I think he was East Carolina. Uh, Andrew Voorhees, Tyus Bowser, Nick Moore, like even, the, even their long snapper is like athlete. Yeah. There's a, you know, enters at the end of the season. That crap happens, but sure. you want to come into the season as fresh as possible. And if it means you might sacrifice your game or two now to not lose because you're playing backups at the end of the season. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's frustrating. It is to watch like teams work through rust in a game that means something, man. I, I think you've got to agree with the, uh, with the results. I mean, the Rams kind of started the trend. And they went to two Super Bowls, won one of them with, yeah. with Sean McVay. And that's obviously that's where Zach Taylor came from. So, hey, if I'm going to be frustrated, let it be in September. I mean, of course, we were all frustrated Sunday. I felt we all felt helpless. It just felt like ugh, there was just all the air got taken out of the building immediately. But yeah. that's cool because there we will have air in the building later in the year. Uh, so, uh, you know, the people that bash Zach Taylor for not playing people in the preseason, I just, the proof is in the pudding. Uh, you know, everybody's healthy. And what has destroyed our playoff runs? Health. I mean, to be fair, health. Um, you know, and I hate to use that as an excuse, but let's just control what we can control and try to stay as healthy as possible. And I think he's done that. So I give I give Zach Taylor credit. And it takes a takes a big time decision to, you know, week one, you don't look as good as you could. Um, that that's a tough, that's a tough decision. Yeah, and it's you know again, it's you don't want to sacrifice anything, but it's you know play your best football, be as healthy as you can at the end of the season, then early in the season. So yeah, we'll deal with that. Um, who do you think is going to spy Lamar for the team? Um, I know that you said you would love uh, Dax. I, I think that's uh, a very good, uh, very solid option. Um, so that's that's probably where I would go as well. Um, but I think they have a lot of choices. And I think that uh, what that what would be their best uh, would be to do, you know, Lou Anarumo special and uh, let's let's mix it up. Um, so I, I think they'll they'll have multiple looks um, for him and, and they'll keep him on his toes. Uh, so I, I'm just excited to see what Lou comes up. Trying to guess what he's going to do is like, impossible uh the the guy's a genius so i'm just rather than what do i think's gonna happen i'm just very excited to see what he comes out with because he really is so he's just an innovator i mean he's just incredible i i as a defensive coach i just love watching his game plans and i just i i literally enjoy watching his game plans who, who says that uh that right. i do i do i i, th I think it's <laughs> phenomenal um we do have some breaking news. Uh, Joe Burrow cut his hair. He has he's back to his more shorter coiffed hair. Okay. Uh, apparently, having the floppy, you know, the shaggier hair didn't work. I thought it looked good, but maybe you know, just trying to get the mojo back. Um, okay, you know, our, our boy Darnell got him a good haircut. All right, good. Yeah, I mean that's you know, look good, feel good, play good. Um, Joe Osai has the helmet, so it looks like he'll be practicing today. That's a good sign that. Um, you know, it doesn't mean anything, but it's a good sign that he's at least got a chance to play over the weekend. Um, I don't know. Again, I don't know how much impact he's going to have because you're playing a more running based team. Um, unless the Ravens look totally look up to shift up their normal game plan, but um, more healthy bodies are better. Um, I wonder how Jermaine Pratt would be uh, spying Lamar. Obviously, he's not as fast and shifty as a, you know, um, Dex Hill is, but I think he's fast enough, and obviously he's a lot more sure-handed tackler than uh, than defensive back's going to be. That's that's the part I like about Anna Rimo, and it's the part I like about what the Bengals have done systematically um, as an organization to 
to give themselves options. And we talked about this months ago um, in the offseason, having options. And I, and I think we were talking about offense, but we were also talking about defense too. Yeah. I think uh, the fact that you can spy Lamar from multiple levels of the defense to me is super valuable. Because um, if I can identify who the spy is or where, uh, what level of the defense the spy is on, it's going to change some things. Um, it's going to make it a little bit easier offensively. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see the Bengals spy him from multiple levels. And I think that would be, uh, it would make it much tougher on the Ravens to try to identify not only coverage, but also who the spy is, where the spy is coming from. Um, and I think, I think Pratt is capable uh, of doing, doing that. So I do think just being multiple is going to be a good thing for the Bengals on defense. This seems like a game to where they might drop a lot more guys back into coverage. Um, you're not, you're not um, getting out of your rush lanes. You're not giving Lamar Jackson a uh, lane to escape and you've got more guys in the second and third levels. I, I think some, maybe like if Osai is able to play, I mean, he's a guy that can, I don't, not that he's great coverage as an edge, but someone who's, you know, able to at least, you know, keep him reined in, you know, if, when Lamar gets to break the, uh, break the pockets easier to control him, you know, when you're facing, you know, not trying to run, uh, I'm trying to say not rushing around the edge, getting pushed around. You you know, if you're in space, you get a little better chance of at least having a better attack angle at him. So, um, yeah, it, it's, you're, you're right. It's popcorn viewing just to see what Lou's going to do, but I expect they're going to have a good game plan. They had a good game plan last week and they just got worn down. Yeah. Uh, will the defensive lines feast on their O-line though, since they're missing two? Is this a game maybe that you, you know, and after I just said drop more into coverage, this game maybe you bring more because they've got two backups. Yeah, you, you say because they have two backups. I think we are ready to witness this defensive line become one of the better defensive lines in the NFL. I just yeah. I just love the depth of this defensive line. I think we're at a spot where we should get to the point where we think we should feast every week on the defensive line. Um, so I, I'm very excited to continue to see the D-line and some individuals on the D-line grow uh, with the units. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I fully expect the defensive line to feast uh, this week, and I expect them to feast almost every week. I just I, – I love our defensive line. Yeah, I mean, the Browns have one of the better offensive lines in the football, and Bengals still got in a lot on Watson and put a lot of hits on him, especially early. So um, you think the offense – does Bengals offense get right or at least get – looking more like what we would expect. Yes. I, I I can't stress to you enough how important, especially in the NFL, more so than any other level of football, how important first down is. And, and the Bengals are not a team that's going to line up and run the ball on first down, and that's going to get everything done for them on offense. They're just not that team. The Bengals need to be able to line up on first down, in a little two by two, three by one set, and be able to hit a seven yard hitch. And now we're sitting at second and three. And now the defense is in real crisis mode because what do you do? Do you come after Joe like crazy? Do you, there's just a lot to it. So, first down to me is the key. Uh, being able to throw the football on first down is the key. Clearly, on Sunday, that was not possible because of weather and some other things. Uh, I think we're going to see an entirely different offense. When the defense knows you can't throw the ball vertically, the entire game changes. Now I'm covering a 10-yard box. Um, that's everything. And, exactly. And, and that's exactly what the Browns did because there was no shot of completing a vertical pass unless somebody was open by 10 yards. Um, so this week against the Ravens, the vertical passing game will be an option uh, as long as weather stays like they're predicting it's going to be, which it looks like it's just going to be gorgeous. Um, I, I don't think I saw any rain in the radar for the next five days uh, when I was looking at it. So if the vertical passing game is an option, I think that opens up the underneath passing game, opens up the run game. I just, you know, screen game. I think everything opens up. So, yes, I think you'll see an entirely different Bengals offense. And uh, do not blame Zach Taylor for week one. I just think the Bengals were handcuffed and only had so many options uh, this week. I think you'll see just entirely different. Uh, 76 and mostly sunny on Sunday. So, yeah, that'll I do. Here for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, 
Ravens are going to missing two defensive backs. Starter, well, potentially missing two defensive backs. Definitely missing Marcus Williams. Even if Marlon Humphrey's there, he's been cooked and roasted and fricasseed and barbecued at full strength by Jamar Chase and the Bengals before. So you're not even if he is there, you're not getting the full strength. The Ravens are not a team with a very strong pass rush either. So I I think this is a chance, even with Burrow still not hundred percent, that they can put up a lot of uh, a lot of yards. Yeah, um, I, 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 you definitely could be at the point where you go, oh my god, like how is this? How do you have this transformation in one week? I, I can definitely see that happening. Yeah, um, and again, shorter hair, less weight on his calf. Maybe you know he's he's got a little more. Uh, mobility extend plays we'll see um final predictions Bengals 31 17 uh, i think it's, they come out play good defense and I, I think they will move the ball in a way you haven't seen i was actually at the exact same spot i'll go 34 14 just to change it up okay um again yeah i think burrow's gonna throw for damn near 300 yards um definitely going to hook up with T Higgins not going to be 0 for 8 targets to receptions that's never going to happen ever again um I'd like to see the run game used more again like yeah they're not they don't use the run game to set anything up it's more use the pass game to set up the run but they had transitioned to more of an RPO type game a bit last year use it a bunch in uh preseason obviously with caveat with the backups uh, I didn't I don't recall seeing any of that against Cleveland do you, do you remember seeing any RPOs no, and I and I think it makes perfect sense. Why would I? Why would I waste a new thing in a week that's not conducive to any of it and uh, might have might have failed anyways? Um, the more information you give out, the quicker people have it. Uh, the you know NFL doesn't miss information. Uh, I can promise you that. You know, so um, that's probably something Zach Taylor decided to holster um, just because of the conditions. It is is my guess. And I think that's a very wise play because you could have had all the RPOs you wanted. It was not going to work um, on Sunday. So I think holster in that was, was smart. I do agree. It, it's seeing the offense run at its full potential. I think when it gets there and again, I'm there's no reason to think that it can't at least get as close as they can with where Burrow is in being healthy. Uh, no reason to think that they can't get there this week. This matchup, is very favorable to them. And it's weird to say that against the Ravens, but with their injuries and where they are and to whom, um, Bengals are only two and a half point favorite. And I think it should be a lot larger considering home, you know, home teams still traditionally get about three points. I, I think it'd be closer to a touchdown favor, but that's yeah. not really important. Um, yeah. I mean, I, they absolutely should beat them. Should beat them handily it's never going to be easy because it's a it's a uh divisional game and you know the the teams know your personnel they know what you're trying to do at, you know so they, they at least know how to at least try to deal with it you know there's no secrets between them but it, i would be surprised if this if, if, if anything like last week happened i was surprised when yeah. last week happened anyway yeah i would agree um one thing we didn't hit on earlier when we were doing it in the notes but do you feel bad for Jet fans? For who? Uh, New York Jet fans. Oh, New York Jet fans. Uh, I really, really do. Uh, I, I was watching that game, and I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the most Jets-like scenario ever. <laughs> I mean, you trade away all the stuff. Uh, you have you have a former, what was Zach Wilson, second overall, third overall, whatever he was. Yeah. You have that guy sitting on the bench, and you go out and trade for – God's gift to the earth and Aaron Rodgers, or at least self probably self-proclaimed. Uh, and he throws one pass out of bounds and it's over. I mean, the whole thing's over. I felt horrible for Jets fans. And I think the reason is because uh, I know what they feel like. Uh, we had plenty of years of just being dejected, um, you know. So, yes, I feel for Jets fans. But in the same token, I also feel for Bills fans. What are you doing? You have a 10-point lead against Zach Wilson at halftime. And Josh Allen's out here slinging it around, throwing it up for grabs. What in the world? I mean, the real concern today 
should be with the Bills. Holy cow. What are they thinking? I mean, that was horrendous. Horrendous. You're up by 10 against Zach Wilson. I, I can't say that enough. <laughs> You're up by 10 against Zach Wilson. You could have. You could have done uh, what, what's the movie where they take a knee? They just take a knee. Uh, the what? The, what's the one? Uh, Adam Sandler, uh, Water Boy. Oh, Water Boy. They just start taking a knee. That's all they had to do. Instead, Josh Allen's out there flinging it around like it's like it's preseason week three. I mean, <laughs> just throwing the ball up for grabs. Insane. But yes, I feel bad for Jets fans. It would. That's just super tough. Just just really tough. I. I'm sorry, I'm getting on a rant about the Bills. But, yes, I feel bad for Jets fans. Just sad to watch. I don't. Um, <laughs> they let their entire team get kind of held hostage by the entire drama that took all offseason long. I'll um, give you that. The Jets let him bring in whoever he wanted to to play with them, even though they were better players on the roster. Um, I think it's hurt in game one, which sucks. But I'm a Bengals fan. I saw Carson Palmer get hurt on the first drive in the playoffs. I'm a Bearcat fan. I saw Kenyon Martin go down right on the precipice of the NCAA tournament as the number one player on the number one team in the country. So I'm not losing any sleep. I'm not shedding any tears. It sucks, but. Yeah. Can I ask a question uh, about that Kenyon Martin team? Yes. When they were number one in the country, who won? Was it Xavier or UC that year? Do you remember? Um. They have they beat them once one more that year than they have final fours in team history. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Check. <laughs> uh, good stuff. I'm sorry. I, I that's okay. Yeah, I I'm really not sorry. Hey, any final thoughts before we get out of here for the I week? do have one final thought. One of our listeners at my other job donated me a card in good faith here. Joey B, this is from Charles. We trust in Joey B. One bad week is not going to kill us. We trust in Joey B. All is well. Everybody calm down. It's going to be all good. We've got our guy. Kuzfraba. Just Kuzfraba. Just chill. Everybody chill. <laughs> Inhale, exhale. Uh, we should be back here Sunday after the game. I wanted to be on here with a uh, live show Sunday at 8 last week. I've been dealing with an awful cold sickness. I, my voice still doesn't sound right to me. I, I um, really haven't been able to have much of a voice at all until today. But the plan from here out is after the games on Sundays, uh, myself and Greg, if he's available, anybody, you know, just to have a live reaction show around 8 o'clock. Um, if the game was a Sunday night or obviously it'll be different. Monday night games will be different, but wanted to have kind of a live reaction show. Um, so we'll be running that back uh, again Sunday live at eight o'clock. Watch us and then flip over and watch late night Reds with Tim Daniel, Ben Brown. They have Paul Yanish, everyone's favorite uh, soft J, everyone's favorite uh, slick fielding Red from early 2010s. Yeah, I forget how long he was around. Uh, uh, was he around 2010s? I think it was on the 2010 team because he had. Yeah, a, you, yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. Yeah, they had um, Drew Stubbs on. Uh, Tim and Ben had Drew Stubbs on last week, on last Sunday's show, and they were uh, talking about that. So uh, Paul Yanish and Chris Dickerson, another former Red, have a podcast on another network of which we won't speak about. But <laughs> cool guys. It's kind of kind of cool just to see him kind of wandering back in Cincinnati waters again. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, check us out. As always, check out our friends on the other Riverfront shows. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Riverfront Cincy. You will be entered in a chance to win Bengals Seahawks tickets. Two tickets. Subscribe. I mean, all you have to do is hit a button. Two tickets. Bengals two, tickets. Two tickets to paradise. Join the family. Patreon.com slash Riverfront Cincy. You too will be able to get in with, uh, get in on our awesome Slack channel, which is always fun. We've got channels for literally everything. Uh, Reds, Bengals, UC, Xavier. Uh, not a lot of people want to talk Xavier for some reason. It's almost like they don't have a lot of fans. <laughs> really weird. I got you started. <laughs> I take full blame. Um, TV movies. I mean, it, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we usually have live hangouts on uh, on Zoom. Just anyone who's available, come on, and we'll just we'll talk with uh, all the hosts and you know anyone who's uh, just part of the channel, come and join. It's a lot of fun. That's where I came from. Maybe you two can get your own show after bugging the hell out of uh, 
uh, <laughs> Nate and Chad Dawson as much as I did. Um, you never know. I mean, I, I maybe I'm gonna maybe I'll just drop out of here. Greg, you take over with with, with someone from Slack Channel and have fun that way. <laughs> I don't more know. I think you have a knack for being able to annoy and, and get what you want. I think is that what it is? <laughs> I'm persistent and I'm obnoxious. Um, that's pretty much how I got my wife. I mean, we're almost up to 18 years of marriage, so he would definitely be one to agree to my uh, persistence and obnoxiousness. So Joe's redeemable qualities. <laughs> it depends on who you ask how redeemable they are. <laughs> yeah. Until Sunday night, y'all take care. Be good. Who day? Who day?